So I expect we'll still have a few more people joining us, but I'd like to get started. Um, captains, I ask if you would keep an eye on the waiting room and let people in um, as we go uh, so that we can focus on, uh, on the presentation stuff. That would be super helpful. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that we are recording a video of this, if you didn't notice that um, when you joined. And that's so that we can share that with other people later. Um, something else that we wanted to share up front here uh, is that we want to be clear about there's there's different expectations for you based on um, your experience with these leadership workshops. Um, so welcome to all of you who have not seen these before. Um, welcome to those of you from other um, first teams, um, and welcome to those of you who this might be your fourth leadership workshop on these topics. Um, and so just as you know, a reminder, some of this information, the slides, what we share with our stories, um, it's new to, to many of you. It's a reminder to some of you. Um, the purpose of the breakout rooms, um, and then when we come back together and we share out um, for those of you who have seen this training before, you're, you're modeling the behavior that we're learning about here. Um, and also, we're, we're leaving rooms for others uh, to, to engage in this material as well. Uh, and then the final thing we wanted to, to remind you of is that um, the interactions among all of us continue after this training. Um, in every Robots After Dark meeting, um, every regular season meeting, um, are, are safe places to, to practice and learn these skills further. Um, I am super excited to welcome uh, Mr. John and Mr. Gupta, who are uh, helping to facilitate this, this evening. Um, and this is our first in our series of leadership workshops. And this one is on servant leadership in the team player mindset. So I'm just gonna say a couple of, uh, that's just about it. Let me get this going the right way. So just to kind of get us started, um, I wanted to remind us, or not necessarily remind us, but sure that whenever we are thinking about our robotic season, there are always two games that we're playing at the same time. And so one way to describe first robotics is as a series of resource limited goal directive cooperative games of invention and communication. I think that sums up what we do throughout the entire season. The two games that we're playing is we're playing this season's game. Okay? Whatever is gonna be unveiled for us in 2023 or whatever has been unveiled for those of you on FTC teams um, just a, a couple months ago. The second game we're playing is next season, the next year. We certainly prioritize the first, but that doesn't mean we can ignore the second. We have to find that balance and where that balance is uh, shifts constantly. So we have to be responsive to that. A big part of all of this um, is our team culture. Um, our team culture that allows us to achieve um, what we do each year um, is built on top of these pillars of being servant leaders and of our team mindset, the questions we ask, the tools we use. Um, really what it comes down to it, it's, it's you all implementing our plan, our goal from the year that makes the difference. Um, if you are not all passionate about our vision, if you're not enthusiastic um, about executing the plan, then it doesn't matter how great our strategy is. Um, there, there's a quote here that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If we don't have the culture to support our strategy, um, we are not going to be effective in terms of achieving our goals. Culture and the culture of a team, the culture of a company is something that happens, whether you uh, work on it or not. Um, it, it represents the very core values of that company. Um, and it's, it's a reflection of, of all of you all as, as leaders. Um, it is something we do want to work on. We don't want it to be an accident. Um, and in fact, a strong culture is the strongest indicator for success um, for any organization, including our team. So 
So All I'm right. gonna pass it out to Mr. John. <laughs> so that's my cue. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna start off with this whole servant leadership thing. And I, I want you to think about beginning with the end in mind. Mr. Schmidt, thank you. Uh, when the challenge is announced, you guys start planning your strategy and your robot design and your marketing because you know what outcome you want. You develop a plan to get you to that end. What I want you to think about for a moment is when you as a leader have an interaction with another team member, what do you want their experience to be? And when I say as a leader, I'm also saying as a, as a servant leader, we are each and every single one of us servant leaders. At the end of the season, how would you want an observer to describe the inner workings of your team? Next. So let's take a moment and uh, before we go any further, fill out this poll on what words you would use to describe a servant leader. So you've already have uh, the handouts available to you. Mr. Schmidt uh, sent them out previously as a link. So go in uh, there. I need to do that right now, actually. Oh, Mr. Schmidt's doing that right now. Um, <laughs> I, so you'll go in there. in the team chat, so. Uh, and and find, find that slide uh, with the poll. And just put in three words all on one line uh, that would describe what you think a servant leader is or does. And then Mr. Schmidt will share that, uh, that word cloud as it develops. Let's see. I do not have the link set up right, it looks like. Let me adjust that so anyone can get to it. There we go. So if you re-click on that link, now you'll be able to actually see all the handouts. There we go. I see everybody jumping in. That's a good sign. And I'm sorry, Mr. Schmidt, should I go back to sharing after this? I think, do you all see my poll? Yes, we see no response received yet. Okay. We are carefully considering our three words, I hope. My screen says waiting for the presentation to begin, but I don't know about everybody else. Oh. I see the same thing. Same thing. Yeah, same with me. Yep. All right, how about now? All right, now it's good. It's now gone it's again. Not no, yeah, it just changed. Like open yeah. and then close. There we go. All right. Apologies, I haven't run the poll like this in a year, probably. All right, cool.
All right, well, it's fun as it continues to update. <laughs> Yep, we've got a couple of people who do not have access to the slides that were sent. I might need to refresh, but they're they're now open to everyone at least. There you go. Good. 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 Well, and this would not be leadership training if we did not have at least a couple of fun issues with the uh, presentations. All right, uh, can we can we see that back on screen? Sure. Okay. All right. So uh, a lot of people came up with selfless, understanding, communicative, inspiring, and empathetic. Uh, there's there's a lot of wonderful words here that help to explain what a servant leader is. You guys have obviously uh, listened in the past, or you have learned from other areas, or you've learned on your own. So those are all wonderful ways to, to come to this point. Um, to, to, to go forward a little bit with the training, if we could go to the first, next slide eight. So servant leadership really has these three ways that you can think about describing um, from a completely different methodology from what you just did. This primary focus to allow the team to keep moving forward. If you are being a servant leader in whatever role you play within this team or teams outside of Huskies, what do you have to do to allow the team to keep moving forward? Well, your primary job function is to handle interruptions that come up and remove obstacles as they, as they show up. And the obstacles might show up, but people might, might not see them. So you might have to discover those obstacles as they're, as they're emerging. And from my perspective, the primary method that a servant leadership is going to employ is listening and responding thoughtfully. So think for a moment, what would not moving forward look like from a team perspective? Just think about that for a moment in your head. And now think about how this concept of the primary job function and primary method could be applied to your interactions with your team. Next slide, please. Leaders are more powerful role models when they learn than when they teach. As a leader, you always have a lot to learn. Other people will bring you problems, and you need to learn from those problems and then communicate a path forward. Teams will find new ways to break things and new ways to create things. You need to learn from these so that you can provide guidance at opportune times. And individuals will surprise you with what they can do and with what they can't. And you have to learn how you can help them to overcome challenges. Next, please. So why do we want to be servant leaders? Next slide. In past years, uh, Jesse, who's one of our mentors and who's on with us, uh, stepped us through Husky's mission as defined in the prior chairman's now the impact presentation. And she noticed some very mission statement-y phases and teased them out. Next slide. And these bits, next slide again, are, are very strong, 
valuable, noble, powerful goals, to use Jesse's words. These things cultivating passion for STEM and first values, creating a team of accepting student leaders, everyone on this team as an accepting student leader, emphasizing diversity and inclusion of people and ideas, increasing innovation and leadership skills, and emphasizing sustainability of this team, of the programs and the projects that we do. You have already accomplished many of these things, but there's always room to grow, which is why we're here today, to learn about leadership. A term that shows up not once, but twice, and has a ripple effect on all of the goals that you see here. Next slide. With these concepts in mind, how do we approach our daily interactions with the team and team members? So let's take a very specific example of a new student joining the team. Some of you on this call are new. Some of you have been around for a while. Everybody has something to add to this conversation. So these three questions, again, they're in your handouts so that when we go to the breakout rooms, you will still be able to uh, reference these three questions. Uh, and determine what kind of experience you want for a new team member, what do you want them, them to remember about their first season, and how do those answers affect the way you lead. Make sure you introduce yourselves to each other. Uh, Mr. Schmidt's going to put a timer out there. That timer will end one minute before the room closes. When we thank, when thank we you for clarifying back, that. <laughs> When we come back, uh, we will use the, the Zoom chat uh, to so you can type in your ideas. Uh, we will say when and we'll uh, submit all of them at the same time. All right. Are we ready to go, Mr. John? We certainly are. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. All right. All right. Welcome back, everyone. One, one just logistical note there is you, um, when you get that warning, you still get a full 60 seconds to wrap up your conversations. You don't have to jump right back in. You're welcome to if you're all done, but you have that extra minute to, to wrap things up in a little bit less of a rushed fashion. So. All right. Um, so uh, please, everybody, go into the Google chat, uh, sorry, the Zoom chat. <laughs> and um, type in your your ideas for uh, for how do the answers that you well actually no let's start with what kind of experience do you want others to have so uh, in a few seconds uh, we will all submit at the same time um, take a moment to to type your ideas in. And then if you're, as you are ready, go ahead and start hitting enter. A lot of welcoming, comforting, good experiences, contributing to a larger goal on the team. That's a positive experience for new members. Yeah. Okay. Getting to know everybody feeling invited. Yeah. All right. So what do we want them to remember about their first season? Take a moment to type. All right. As you're ready, start hitting enter. A lot of fun. Awesome. Times they learned, the community, the feeling of inclusion, being able to make a substantial contribution to the team, the feeling of, of creating something new and wonderful. Very good. The process, 
understanding the process. Yeah, all oh, awesome, awesome. All right, so how do those kinds of answers affect the way that you would lead? Hopefully the way that you will lead. So again, type that all in. And as you are ready, start hitting enter. Having the end goal in mind, having structure, but choose their own adventure. Modeling that you don't have to be perfect to be successful. Uh, good training, giving them opportunities to collaborate, helping understand what the outcomes can be like having a lot of balance to guiding them throughout the processes that we have and being transparent. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you all very much for your thoughtful answers there. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So servant leadership. Um, how, how do we go about actually getting this to be done? Um, let me catch up. So next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, there are, there are some tools that we're going to spend the rest of the time, uh, bringing to you. The first one. We've, we've talked a lot about, uh, sorry, we're, we're just about to talk about, and then we're going to have a lot more conversation in future presentations, but listening and responding with empathy and compassion. Uh, we use the edge method. Uh, so uh, explaining, demonstrating, guiding, and enable. Mr. Gupta will tell us about that in just a little bit. Uh, as, along with situational leadership, which is uh, a wonderful mindset to be in. We also apply, share, and rationalize the tools that we use to build our team's culture. And Mr. Schmidt will be talking about this team player mindset. And throughout all of this, we learn. Next slide, please. So empathy and compassion. Uh, I, I really liked it when uh, Jesse and Mr. Schmidt talked about this last year and the year before. Uh, these four different definitions, uh, pity, seeing someone suffering from a distance and, and not doing anything about it, not having any reaction uh, other than just this pity, whereas sympathy, you know, looking at their suffering and feeling sad for them, taking it to the next step of empathy, seeing through their eyes feeling their pain, but then understanding that compassion is really taking that empathy and then acting on it, doing something to relieve their suffering. Now that's, that's really deep, but you guys are in high school and sometimes you see a lot of people who need someone to do some compassion with them. And that's awesome if you're able to do that at that deep level. At a not as deep level, you're gonna see people who are in your robotics team who are feeling the pain and frustration of not being able to get something done. And if you can empathize with them and then take action to relieve their suffering, you are helping them, you're learning as you go and your team is going to be able to work better. You are removing obstacles. You are being that servant leader. All right, I would like to, to now introduce Mr. Gupta, uh, who's a new mentor with us. And he's going to start talking about EDGE and then serve, uh, the, the leadership, situational leadership mindset. Mr. Gupta. All right, thank you, Mr. John. Can you hear me okay? All right, so great presentation so far and so many students on the call. One thing I wanted to start off with is just something which I use at my work. When we talked about strategy, you know, cultures, it's a strategy at work. 
uh, one of the things we use it in our culture is one team, one fight. You know, so that's a great phrase which we are going to talk about when it comes to these acronyms and approaches to st for you to take and practice servant leadership and team mindset in every situation and every task. So one acronym of approach is EDGE, uh, which stands for explain, demonstrate, guide, and enable. Uh, and this is some of these situations or approaches you can take to understand, truly have that listening and observation skills to understand what to apply based on somebody's capability and the task at hand. So first of all, in every situation, regardless of what you want to achieve, you want to make sure you can explain you know, what is that you want to achieve? Uh, why, and the why is very important. Sometimes people, you tell somebody to do it, but they don't understand why is this important or critical for them to execute. And once that explanation is there, then you can start to demonstrate how that is, uh, that task needs to happen. Now, in many situations, you may not need to because the task is very simple and the person can go and execute that capability on their own. In other situations, you may need to demonstrate that uh, capability. And then subsequently, when you hand over the task, you may not need to. Um, same thing, if you go to the next layer, you might want to you know, guide that person from time to time. You may not need to demonstrate, but you may need to ensure that that, pers and that person is continuously set the right expectation and the outcome is achieved. So again, we talked about being patient with that. Patience means you do not jump and quickly take over the task. You are basically having that leadership team mindset for the person to enable them to be able to go figure it out, right? Continuously guiding them. And the last part is enablement. Enablement means you make sure that there are the right tools, training, uh, all of this required skill set uh, and the support from other team members uh, which is available for them. So if you are a leader on a robotics team, you want to make sure that it's just not your responsibility. Edge is everybody's responsibility, right? It's not just the leader. You can enable others in your team to go help in all of these situations. So you're creating leaders from others as well. And edge is an investment. Investment means you need to make sure that you are taking the time to understand these levels and demonstrate that. So just make sure all of these things are or something you can apply on a daily basis, you think about it, you have this framework in hand, um, and then make sure that it is a continuous cycle. You just don't need to make uh, uh, apply a situation based on one particular task. A task can evolve over time, and a person can evolve over time as well, right? So with that, um, what we want to do is maybe take a quick example of a situation and see how that edge uh, framework acronym can be applied. And for that, all three of us, Mr. Schmidt, uh, myself and Mr. John are going to play a small role here. Let's see if we can pull it off. And for that, I have my, I have my safety glasses as well. All right, I think all of us are looking cool and handsome. All right, so the situation is that uh, we are all on the assembly team and we are working on a robot. Uh, myself, um, I'm bolting, I uh, guess, to a chassis, and Mr. Schmidt hands me a torque wrench to be able to go do a task. Mr. Gupta, uh, only tighten until the wrench clicks. No, I um, Mr. Schmidt then walks away and then I am looking around and trying to figure out, you know, what is that I'm supposed to do here. And and I'm sorting bolts and I overhear the conversation and, and I see Mr. Gupta hesitating a little bit. And so I, I call out, uh, Mr. Schmidt, before you go, it looks like Mr. Gupta might need some demonstration and guidance on how to use that torque wrench. Yeah, thanks, Mr. John. Yeah, I have completed the competency table for most of the tools, but not the talk wrench. Oh, so sorry. I should have checked the table and, and asked what you needed before I started to leave. Are you familiar with why we use the torque wrench? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's start with that. Can I join as well? I haven't learned how to use the torque wrench either. Of course. 
So we use the torque wrench. So Mr. Schmidt, continues to explain why and when we use the torque wrench and demonstrate how to use it with the first bolt and then guides myself, Mr. Gupta and Mr. John as they each tighten a couple of bolts. So in this example, you know, what we were trying to do is if you go back to the edge framework, uh, you know, you were continuing, you have to apply that back by saying is, did you explain the task at hand? You did explain what needs to happen, but did you explain the why? So the why was missing, that was one. Um, did you assess whether the person needs to demonstrate how it's to be done? Uh, and then did you enable them? Enable as in, are you providing the right tools? Are you providing others to go help this person and make sure that the task done is, is safe and uh, you know, meets the critical, criticality of the event? So that example, I'm sure there are numerous examples you guys can apply all of these situations too. Uh, but one other methodology uh, I want to go through is the situation leadership. I particularly use this framework at work and this is a you know, very effective approach in taking a lot of factors in determining how you want to be a servant leader. How do you apply based on a couple of factors? What is the task at hand? Is it really simple, complex? Um, is it critical to the overall uh, capability or uh, initiative you want to achieve? Like the, the bolt we were talking about, what if that tightening of the bolt was part of a component which is critical to the overall functioning of the robot? If somebody is not skilled and tightens too hard, it may break the system and you may not be able to replace it or find another part. Right, so take all of that into factor. Uh, again, is we taking the example, is the person trained on that task or not? And they may be trained, but have they actually executed that task? So maybe you want to support them through the first few cycles. Um, is, and motivation is a key factor. It doesn't mean that if a person is not motivated, you're not necessarily going to give them any task, but you may want to figure out how to inspire them uh, or take that into factoring factor of uh, you know to looking at certain capabilities. Maybe they are motivated by some other capability or task. So maybe find their their motivation. What are they inspired with? The urgency of the task. Um, an example would be you are in the middle of a final you know uh, event and your robot breaks down. Uh, that's not probably a situation you may want to go and delegate to somebody. You you may have to take that situation based on the urgency and safety of the task to go figure out how to fix that. And the last piece is of course, make sure you continuously evaluate the performance of the task. You may start off by uh, delegating a task uh, or sorry, maybe guiding the task or enabling, but maybe you quickly move on to just delegating because you realize that based on the person's motivation and the, uh, they are maybe fast learners you may assess that it's fine for them to go and start executing this task on their own. So there are some framework, uh, the sort of different uh, mappings. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, we will talk about that. <clears throat> you know, again, the examples I was talking about, uh, based on those factors we just went through, there are different leadership styles you can have. One is delegating, which is pretty obvious when, with the word. You delegate a task because the person is skilled, you know, a reliant or has, uh, is able to figure out uh, on their own based on past uh, capabilities. So you may just simply delegate the task or the task itself is, uh, is, uh, does not require a whole lot of skills. The other is of course supporting and you may see that all of this is somewhat mapping to the edge framework as well. But again, these are a little bit more defining leadership styles. Uh, so supporting a person, if they are skilled, but maybe they are very cautious in their approach, they're not too confident, you are supporting that person or, you know, through that phase till they become confident and they have become self-reliant uh, in that capability. Coaching, of course, is, you know, somebody who may be skilled, but, you know, has not been able to figure out or learn on their own. And the last is directing. You literally are working that person step by step because, they are a beginner at the level, or maybe they are not motivated enough, but you're making sure they are you go through that step-by-step -step approach. Like going back to the torque example, uh, in that case, Mr. Schmidt were helping me 
go to the first board. And then he said, okay, now that I have directed you, let me help Mr. John coach you on the, or support you. And then once you have done two or three, you may shift to a delegating style because you've already gone through a few steps doing that. So what we have done is that we have included a, a graphic view of this leadership style. This is available to you in that uh, handbook, which will be uh, sent to you guys, but I will not go through this again, but you can see on the right-hand side, uh, like what we call development levels. Like what is, if you consider just the individual, what is their level of uh, capability? Are they beginner level? Are they high competency and skill set? And then on the left-hand side is how do you start going through the various stages of uh, delegating or providing the guidance to that person based on the task at hand and the criticality. So this will be a great guide, uh, you know, uh, framework for you to keep in hand when you are thinking about servant leadership and team mindset. Right. All right. Then with this, let's do a breakout session. Um, uh, this is a great uh, scenario. I am not, I'm not too familiar with MK4i, but I'm pretty sure it is a very critical component. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Schmidt, should I read this out or do you? I could provide a little bit of context on the scenarios right. um, and then you can provide the context from the situational research or uh, leadership perspective. Um, yeah. So some of you are familiar with these examples and some of you are not. Um, but just to help us all have a more productive conversation, um, the MK4i um, is the latest and greatest word module that uh, is similar to the one we used on last year's Robot Sierra, um, and it's the one we're currently incorporating in our preseason robot. Um, so uh, they are very expensive and have a lead time of several months when ordered from the company that makes them. Um, in terms of the second scenario, high-level strategy and design requirements, here we're focused on like kickoff, right? So the new game comes out, you know, January 7th, 2023. Um, and we're excited to come up with our high level strategy and design requirements. That's that scenario. Um, the third scenario is fabricating buttons. Uh, so for those of you not familiar, we bring um, literally thousands of buttons with us throughout our competitions, uh, the different places we travel. And part of the culture of first is to visit different teams um, and, and get different buttons from different teams and put them on your shirt, your bag, whatever, um, and have a wonderful collection of everyone who is, is there. So this is fabricating buttons for the Missouri Regional, which will be our regional after we attend the Midwest Regional in Chicago. Um, and the fourth scenario is for a new feature that first pre-announced um, a little bit ago, and that is, that's writing code for analyzing April tags. April tags Think of an April tag as kind of like a QR code for a robot where a camera can look at it and use that tag to, to get some uh, identifying information specifically where is the robot in relationship to that tag um, is what that's useful for. So those are a little bit of context about the, the scenario that you uh, have the option to consider. Great. So yeah, again, keep uh, that edge and situation leadership uh, approaches in mind as you're thinking about these uh, these various scenarios. Like just again taking the SOAR model example, what I heard is that it's a very critical module. It is not a whole lot of documentation available. So how will you figure out? I mean, because you also as a leader or a person who is directing the task may not have a whole lot of knowledge around it, but at the same time it's critical. So how would you consider delegating coaching kind of mindset within that framework versus something where it might be a straightforward task to write some code. So keep all of those scenarios in mind. And then of course, you cannot analyze all the development levels because it will largely depend on who you're dealing with, but you could probably take an example. I, I think students can take an example of a development level, correct? Okay. So with that, we can probably uh, break out into sessions. So we definitely, we want to hear what you all had said. Um, and so probably the easiest way to do this is to have the spokesperson from your group um, raise a hand and I'll pop up on the list here. And then we can uh, listen to uh, a few of these.
All right, Aaron, go ahead. I see that you've, you're here. Well, to start with the first scenario, um, assembly of a valuable and hard to replace module for a chassis that would probably be delegated to delegated to or supported. So comp people who, with high competence don't necessarily need a ton of intervention with leaders um, self-sustaining. For the second scenario um, is a little bit more open since it's a collective team thing. You don't necessarily need to be super familiar with the functioning of the robot to have good ideas as to how we can hypothetically make it. And all ideas should be considered. So everyone and all leadership styles are welcome there. The third one, we had a little bit of an interesting conundrum with because fabricating the buttons is very central to the culture. So we want to make sure we have a good button. But we need like a lot of people working on that. So sort of everyone with an asterisk, a little bit more independence and skill is required for making the button. But once it's into the mass production, that's fine. And as for writing code, we said uh, everyone but the enthusiastic beginners, just because since it's brand new, you don't want to be without the basics and being thrown right into a brand new deeper end of the field than we've ever been in before. So as long as you're familiar with what you're doing in essence, everyone's figuring it out. We're all on even ground there. Great. Um, for the next few here, just because we don't have a ton of time, I'd like you to pick your favorite of the of the four scenarios to share out what your what your group talked about. Um, so, uh, Abraham, you're up next. It looks like. Oh, uh, my name is Abi Ram, but ah, so I, um, rather than speaking to like a certain scenario, um, I want to speak like in general to like considering all scenarios. Um, I would say that with, with any scenario, actually, I feel like whenever considering like leadership, right? I would want the um, members of like the group, like, like everyone in the group to be able to like, I, I want to provide enough to them to where like enough of a background to them to where they can develop their own sort of thinking and their own sort of logic on how to go about the scenario. Because one one way to do everything isn't always the right, it isn't always right. There can be multiple efficient and effective ways to do things. So I would consider like spending time with the whole group on just getting to know the basics and the background of anything that they they could be building or tweaking on the robot, and I would use this I would use that time to, um, you know, know that know that background and everything, and then develop the logical thinking skills, and like how to, how to move forward in that topic in that certain scenario. I think that that as a group will bring up everyone and it and it doesn't really distinguish between every anyone it just it'll bring up everyone as a whole because then everyone can have an uh, have expertise certain expertise in the topic and as a leader i feel like as a leader should be i'm, I'm, I'm i think a leader should be like in in a group in any group a leader should just have the ex expertise to explain but should really be overseeing everyone in the group rather than leading from the front. I feel like they should lead from the back where they can oversee everyone in the group and can bring up another member if they're falling behind rather than leading from the front and not looking at the other members. That's a great way to think about uh, servant leadership, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, one thing you added was uh, just want to say that the assess the situation, of course, right, as a team. Uh, but in certain situations, you may need to lead from the front, right? The, I think, again, the example one scenario where it's a very critical module and not a whole lot of uh, supporting example documentation is available. You may have to lead from the front to make it 
uh, enable the team and then take a step back for them to be able to, you know, guide them out. Yeah, so exactly. assessing whatever, like whatever in the development stages, whenever we're like thinking of the background behind it on how to like actually go about assembling it, like uh, definitely there, that's where the leader needs to sort of lead from the front to spread expertise. But then once once the leader can recognize that the group is ready to move on to the next stages of development and that the the group has the necessary skill to do it, then the leader can then step take a step back. Yeah. Good point. Elena. Um, I'll keep mine pretty short, but something to add on to the first scenario is that I think specifically kind of like Mr. Gupta said, because um, the MK4I has really little documentation, like I know as of right now, um, we have a leader kind of leading from the front with that one. Um, so that's why you need somebody who's like dedicated and has knowledge. But I think once the documentation is made, it's like a really good um, enthusiastic beginner activity to do. So also depends on like what process, like what part of the process we're in for a certain task. Uh, Simi? Um, so our group thought that the second scenario is really interesting. Um, instead of being more like a leadership style, this would be, in my opinion, more of a collaboration setting where we can all get together because it's really important for this kind of stuff to get different perspectives, even as new members, you know, like we appreciate the contribution. So um, having the that kind of circle where we can talk about what everybody thinks about last year's and then the next year's is really important. Um, Tyler. All right. So my group, uh, my group said for the first scenario, um, have like a team member uh, who may not be as proficient as you are, um, work on the swerve module and like implementing into the chassis, but then also like observe them, make sure they're not like doing something wrong. Basically, uh, just be a basically choose someone that's a capable but cautious performer uh, to ensure that it's very uh, hard to get. Um, sort of module isn't broken. Excellent. All right. So to kind of transition into the next part of this of this workshop, uh, everyone here and everyone on our team is a servant leader at times. Um, and that's the role that you'll you'll fill, fill regardless of whatever official leadership role you have on the team. That's that's not really relevant to that. Um, but for some of you, you spend almost all of your time being servant leaders um, because of your role on the team. What I want us to focus on now is to shift our perspective a little bit to the fact that regardless of whether we're fulfilling a servant leadership role in the moment or not, all of us are always team players because we're always on the same team. And so the question I want to pose to you to get us started here, um, it's much like at the beginning, we, we brainstormed and shared our thoughts on uh, what is a team player, or I'm sorry, what is a servant leader? We are now shifting to what is a team player mindset? Um, so we're going to use the same poll, um, and that this too is in your handout slide. Um, and I Maybe someone can throw it in the chat to make it easier for everyone as well. That would be helpful. And I'm going to shift over and make sure the poll is open. Um, and think of think of three words that describe a team player mindset to you. And we will go from there. We're still waiting for the presentation to begin. I think I've got it. Is it good now? Yep. Okay, slow to switch screens. All right.
as we see this evolve, I think it's interesting to see that some of the same words that are showing up here that we're using to describe the team player mindset were the same ones that we were using to describe uh, servant leaders. So there's definitely some overlap there in terms of these perspectives. You may have a window over your shared screen. Or maybe oh. it's me. I don't see it. See um, Yeah. yeah. I agree. It says resume. Well, let's see. I think I fear if I, well, here, let's see what I can do. Thank you, Jesse. Is that better? Yep, looks good. All right. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed looking at this evolved on my screen as we were going along. But um, there's a lot of really good ideas there. So, you know, you can see the ones that jump out, supportive and cooperating and listening and helpful and inclusive and open, um, proactive, all sorts of, of great things here. Um, so what I want to share with you all, I'm going to shift to back to the screen here. So I want to build on this a bit and focus on um, what we've identified as six strengths of a team player. Um, and then for, for most of these, share with you some tool or technique, um, strategy that you can employ to be a strong team player um, and leverage these and develop these strengths. Um, so we're going we're gonna to focus on each of these as, as we go along, but to give you a quick overview here, um, humble and self-aware is, is the idea that you're, you're comfortable not knowing everything. Um, I love how, how Mr. Rousey will stand out in the hallway after school as students are walking by to catch the bus and say, come join robotics. And they'll say, I don't know anything about robotics. And he'll say, that's okay, neither do I, come on. Um, and he just reinforces the idea like, it's okay not to know this stuff. We'll learn it together. We'll figure it out together. Um, we'll focus on discipline. Uh, achieving the goals we have for the team um, definitely requires discipline on all of our parts. Um, we're going to have a whole section on compassionate and acting on empathy, uh, another leadership workshop, so we won't spend a lot of time on that this evening. Um, being courteous to each other, respectful to each other, that reflects our team's values. Uh, we'll focus on how we can be transparent um, and encourage that openness. And then also on the idea of growth mindset. So several of you um, who have me in class um, are familiar with that idea, and, and many of you might be as well, uh, but that plays a big role as being team players. One way in which we leverage our strength of being humble is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, so I have a couple of quotes here that, that you may have heard before. Good artists copy, great artists steal. Um, I think that's a Steve Jobs quote. Um, and I think that applies to FIRST Robotics really well, too. Um, in, in, in the corporate world, we might refer to that more as make versus buy decisions um, in terms of what are we going to develop internally and what are we going to purchase from, from someone else. Um, one thing I want to be clear about with this, uh, and, and I've, our team has matured, I think, significantly in this area over the years, um, leveraging other examples out there, leveraging other things people have invented out there, um, buying things when they're available. It doesn't limit our creativity. Um, it doesn't hamstring our, our innovation. Um, rather, it frees resources to apply that creativity and that innovative spirit in other ways that might be even more beneficial to us as a team. Um, it's okay not to invent everything ourselves. And I think we've, we've done a really good job with that over the last few years. Um, and so that's, that's one technique we can use that helps us along. Um, our second, oh, so some examples of this, because I just want to make this a little more concrete. That was pretty vague. Um, some examples with which you may be familiar. Um, this one actually is before most of your times, maybe everyone's time at this point. Deep Space was several years ago. Um, that was the robot Clementine. We grab, grabbed these hatch panels um, and we pick them up from the loading station. We put them on these spaceships. Um, they're big Velcro discs. Um, and the approach we took there in terms of standing on the shoulders of giants and being humble was instead of designing a mechanism that would need several 
degrees of freedom um, and be an active mechanism. We went to Home Depot and we bought a hinge for like a, um, a saloon style door, a door that can open in both in and outward. And we just bolted that to the robot. And we literally had the best hatch bot in the world that year. We were the most effective at scoring hatch panels in the world. Um, and we bought the key mechanism off the shelf at Home Depot to achieve that. Um, another great example that I think shows the maturity of our team and our willingness to stand on the shoulders of giants is last year's robot, the 2022 Swerve Drive design. We had spent an entire year developing our own Swerve Drive, version two of the Husky Robotics Swerve. Um, and after spending a whole year doing that and building it and having it be really good and a fraction of the weight and size of the previous one, we still looked at all the options out there and decided to purchase the MK4 instead. Um, and I think that led our team to a lot of success last year. That was a really good decision for us. All right, so moving along. Um, how, what, what do we do to help us be disciplined? So in all of these things, these are this, this is a strategy that helps us amplify our, our strength of being disciplined. We have a lot of workflows now on our team. Workflows, um, more the most general sense, think of it as a commitment that we make to each other. Um, we design these workflows to help us uh, mitigate risks, to help us be more transparent, um, to help us communicate efficiently with each other. Um, because when we take shortcuts in our process, uh, we're really not saving time, we're really stealing resources from the future. And those resources are gonna be repaid and they're gonna be repaid with interest. And that can be really expensive. Um, so a couple ideas here to make this a little bit um, more straightforward. Um, we used to just, students used to just tell me, hey, Mr. Schmidt, could you order this thing? And, and as many of you know, my short-term memory isn't the greatest. And so things would get forgotten. I would order them incorrectly. Um, so now we have a Google form and that process has evolved over the years, which is great. Um, we used to just throw things in done when someone thought they were done. And then we realized people have different definitions of done. So now we have a list for things that we think are done and things that we've confirmed are done. Um, and no longer do we, uh, that saves a lot of miscommunication. Um, this, this may be hard to believe, but early on in the team's history, we would just show up for a match and we would do our best and we'd forget to do things like strap the battery in um, or change the battery or screw down a bumper or all sorts of things. We don't do that anymore because we have pre-match checklists, we have on-field checklists, we have post-match checklists. Um, and that has made our team much more competitive. What I'd like to do now, just to break this up a bit from the examples I shared, many of you have other really good examples of the workflows this team relies upon that helps us leverage our strengths. So um, go ahead and share those in the chat just so everyone here can see more examples of the workflows we used um, to help uh, amplify our strength of being disciplined. And as they fly by, I'll try to verbally share some of them if there are too many. If you're newer to the team and you're sitting there going, I don't know what any of our workflows are, that is totally okay. Um, these are all examples that you'll be learning about over the next several weeks. Um, uh, so I see that the whole team workflow that we've been doing this preseason, we do during the build season as well. So we can see on one page what every sub team is doing, what feature they're working on, who gets the robot. Um, the software feature sheet, what are all the, the features that are implemented by software, which button <laughs> controls that feature, very important stuff to keep track of. Yeah, each feature project manager creates their own workflow for their feature um, in terms of where it is and the details that need to be done each day. Um, the high level season workflow, excellent examples. Yeah, we, we have uh, sheets that keep track of what parts need to be fabricated or machined, um, what the priorities are, who's doing it, when we expect it to be done, who gets it when it is done, what part number it has, all our assembly workflows. 
Yeah, we design mechanisms that are so complicated that we need a document to tell us how we put those things together. Absolutely. Um, one year we didn't have that. and We spent all Saturday putting it together and then taking it back apart. Yeah. Now we have assembly workflows. We have learned from that, which is great. All right, let's look at some other um, activities and strengths here. Um, so different ways we can be compassionate. So that Mr. John shared this earlier, um, we are going to have a whole leadership workshop next Monday on crucial conversations. And we're going to focus on these ideas in more details then, um, as well as the following week after that. So we're just going to, we'll come back to that. Um, courteous. What is a technique we can leverage to be more courteous with each other? Uh, the idea here is, is breadcrumbs. Um, in terms of breadcrumbs, think of like the, the fairy tale story where you're not sure of, of, you need to find your way home at the end. So you leave breadcrumbs as you go so you can find your way back to where you started. Um, breadcrumbs are what we leave for both others who might come after us or even for ourselves because often we forget where we were and what we've done. Um, breadcrumbs capture what is the next step when I come back tomorrow, when I come back in a week. Um, Breadcrumbs make it easier for someone else to pick up your project where you left it off. Um, and, and one thing that's really important is very often when we're interrupted, um, in that moment and that shock of getting out of our flow and the task we're working on at hand, we can forget these types of details. So another way we can be courteous with each other is when we do need to interrupt someone, give them a moment to capture what that next step is or to transfer their task to someone else that we don't lose that, that efficiency. Um, here are some, some examples that we, we do as part of our, our, our team. Um, at the end of the evening or when we're done working on something, the parts for the mechanism go in the tote for that mechanism. Um, we don't just put it away wherever because we know it, uh, we need to be able to find it quickly. Um, and some of those parts are, are irreplaceable within the time frame of a season. Um, we, even though we're, we might be tired at the end of the meeting or tired when we get home from the meeting, we take a few minutes and we update our cards in Trello um, so we know what the progress we accomplished are and what the next steps are, keep everybody on the same page. Um, when we do a design review, and we just had a design review yesterday, um, we create a, a document, a checklist of what needs to be done um, so that we make good use of everybody's time um, at these as we iterate through these, these design reviews. So these are all, all different mechanisms that, that we have developed over the years to help us be courteous to each other. Uh, this one's really important. One way that we're transparent is by admitting failure. Um, and in two weeks, we're going to focus on crucial accountability. And I have here a quote from one of the co-authors of that book um, that says, the health of any relationship team or organization can be measured by the lag time between identifying and discussing problems. Um, the healthier we are as a team, the less time it takes for an issue to make it from you to a team lead, to a captain, to a coach. Um, we will fail over and over again. It's not an if. We do it all the time. Um, and in fact, it is a key reason why we are successful um, because we're constantly pushing ourselves um, to achieve higher, higher levels in, in everything that we do. And so in order to do that, we have to, and you all as leaders have to model, it's, it's okay to fail. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask questions. Um, we don't have to know everything. And we, in fact, don't know everything. Um, and we don't have to always be right. Um, a great way for you all to practice servant leadership is to admit um, when you make mistakes and admit things you don't know. Um, that makes everyone else on the team more comfortable. Um, here's a couple of examples of how by admitting failure, um, we can be more transparent. Um, you have a conversation with a teammate. You look back on that and you're like, well, I think they were pretty frustrated. I don't know what to do about that. Totally understandable. So you reach out to a mentor to get some help and coaching for how do you have this upcoming crucial conversation. Um, the bandsaw blade breaks. You're using it completely appropriately. 
but these things break, they wear out, they need to be replaced. You don't just walk away, you go and tell a coach and we get that blade replaced before school starts the next day. Um, maybe you made a commitment to the chairman's team to provide feedback on the chairman's essay. Uh, you've been busy. And so you waited till the last day to provide that feedback. And then all of a sudden you're told you have to take your younger sister to, to her practice. Um, you immediately send a message to the awards lead. Hey, I said, I do this thing. This other thing came up and now I'm going to be late. Okay. Um, that's, that's being transparent about the situation. Let's hear some other examples from you all in terms of ways that um, admitting failure can help us be more transparent and make our team uh, more supportive. Let's so go ahead in the chat and share examples you can think of um, of admitting failure and resulting in a stronger team in the end. Yeah, identifying where we need another workflow. Maybe things aren't as efficient or as productive as they should be. Oh, I love that example. I was thinking of that example and I was hoping you would share it to me. Yeah, that um, we learned just before a regional that the climber didn't quite work as we expected. Um, and that we all missed that, <laughs> everyone. And then we learned from that and we came up with an even better climber, which was so successful, which was one of the highlights of the robot last year. Yeah, sometimes our logic isn't right. Oh, I like this one. When you think something might be broken, saying something. That gearbox doesn't sound quite right. I think someone should listen to it, right? That's a great thing to share before we totally wreck it. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of times we, we do something and we realize, oh, maybe this isn't, maybe soldering the wires on the can coder isn't as simple as we thought. Um, there are more ways to do it incorrectly than we realized. Let's create some documentation and add it to our reference board in Trello. Absolutely. These are great examples. All right, I want to move on just because um, we have a, another breakout that's really important um, that I want to make sure we get to. All right. Um, growth mindset. So these are some ways that you can adapt a growth mindset. And, and just one thing I want to share on with this that I think is helpful for you all to consider is often when you hear about growth mindset, um, especially if maybe you first learned about it when you were younger and you, and you were shared a, a simpler model of it, growth mindset isn't that you're working hard. It's not that you have high expectations. It's not that you're resilient or open or flexible. Those are all useful traits. None of those are, is a growth mindset. The growth mindset is simply the belief that your qualities can change and you can develop your intelligence and abilities. When you truly believe that in a given context, like FIRST Robotics, then it will result in um, a wide variety of strengths where you are willing to embrace challenges, you have more persistence, you realize it takes practice to develop mastery, you crave feedback um, so that you can grow um, and you're not threatened by, but rather you celebrate and find inspiration in the success of those around you. Um, that really helps us grow as individuals and therefore as a team. We're gonna skip over these because we have more important stuff and we only have a few minutes left, which is fine. Um, if you're like, wow, that was a lot. I'm not sure how I can always have this team player mindset. You are absolutely correct. It is a lot. One technique that I find helpful and you may find helpful is when I'm stuck and I'm not sure how to adapt a team player mindset in a given situation, I ask myself various questions. All of these questions, as well as other resources from this evening's presentation, are in a Trello card on servant leadership 
um, and situational leadership in our Trello reference board. Um, these are also in your handout as, as well. Um, so you can refer to this stuff later. It doesn't have to just be tonight. All right. I think we're going to cut this a little bit short because we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to give you an opportunity for a final breakout. I think this is a nice way to sum up this entire workshop. Um, and what we'd like you all to do here in your breakout rooms um, is to let's just pick one of these two scenarios. You decide as a group which scenario you would like to pick. Um, and then as a group, uh, whichever one you pick, um, start by assessing the situation uh, for whichever one it is, and then think throughout everything we've discussed tonight, um, which techniques, which questions are going to be most appropriate? Um, what is not appropriate to do in the situation? How does, be, how does servant leadership and a team player mindset help in this particular situation? Um, and, and how that reflects in our culture. So try to Try to tie everything in together here with one of these two. Um, I'll give you five minutes. We're going to run a little bit over, um, but then we'll come back and listen to just a couple of examples. Let me get the rooms open here quickly. There we go. And I'll see everyone back here in five. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so in the interest of time, what I'd like to do is have um, one of the breakout rooms that did scenario one, tell us what, summarize your discussion, and then we'll do the same thing for scenario two. So is there someone from a breakout room who focused on scenario number one that would we be willing to share with us what your group discussed? Yeah, Jack, go ahead. Okay, so for scenario one, uh, my group really focused on that you want to make sure you approach them in like a friendly way. You don't want to like scold them for not doing something. And it's okay to also be like watching somebody else do something. But in this scenario, we're assuming that you can tell that they're not just watching, but that they're like fidgeting and not having something to do themselves. So we wanted to make sure that we approach them in like a, a friendly manner and first engage them in like conversation. We don't actually have, have to like rush to the point of like, why aren't you doing something? something like that but we would that was really what we prioritized and what wouldn't be appropriate would be like scolding them for fidgeting or not having something to do because they might not know that they can go to the backlog or mini tasks to go find something to do and you can then tell them that without being harsh and you can then foster a relationship of helping as well I love that. I love the focus on fostering the relationship and, and not just addressing the issue. That is fantastic for leading until next week. Um, how about a group that did um, scenario number two that we could hear from? Yeah, Ayush, go ahead. Yeah, so um, for scenario two, we kind of talked about, so like um, for like the first week, like A and B kind of go together. But so you definitely don't want to like rush putting on the scusset in the last 10 minutes like you have and like doing it wrong and then having to come back next meeting and like fix that um, problem that you have and that might take even more time. Um, what we said was like in this next 10 minutes, like instead of focusing on making a plan for what to do maybe next meeting on how to get the scusset on, like maybe if you need more support or if you need any help, um, making sure that's in place for next meeting so that you're able to get the scusset on um, in the least amount of time possible. Um, and then uh, kind of like our, and then talking about team culture, we said like one that's very, um, I guess, understanding and supporting, um, also being able to uh, like adapt to these kind of like um, kind of setbacks in a sense. So uh, like when it comes to understanding, understanding that like they weren't able to get it done and then making sure you have a plan um, so that like if they need more support and talking to them to make sure that they have more support if they need that. Um, and then also being able to adapt and just um, being able to kind of change what you were planning to do next meeting based on like this kind of setback. Excellent. So thank you all. I'm sorry I uh, didn't leave more time for, for more discussion and, and apologies for the slow start there as I try to remember how all this technology works. Um, I did wanna make sure everyone knows what's coming up next. So uh, next week is Crucial Conversations. 
Uh, we will not be having a workshop on Halloween, but we'll be back on November 7th for crucial accountability. The following week will be project management and failure analysis. After that is goals and visioning. And then the captains are gonna lead the last session on the development of vision and success instruments. So we have a lot of good stuff left for you all um, this fall. So uh, please uh, give a special thank you to Mr. John and Mr. Gupta um, for, for facilitating today's workshop. Um, and I hope you all have uh, a great evening. Uh, question, where can we find the recordings? Yes, great question. Um, once I have a chance to edit these videos, um, we will put them up on our team's YouTube channel in a playlist for the 2022 Leadership Workshop Series. Um, so that will be up on YouTube in a few days, probably. And can you jump ahead two slides? Yes. Oh, I forgot about this one. Oh, yeah. Very, thank you, Mr. John. I almost forgot. This is also in your handout. Um, so you can click right on the link. Um, we, uh, we mentors are trying to model um, these, these good workflows, one of which is our keep, fix, tries. So tonight, if you have time, or tomorrow, the sooner the better, so you remember more. Um, please capture any feedback you have on this leadership workshop session, because um, that will help us mentors make it even better next year. All right. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, and I'll see you next time.